This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the last chapter in the series, Taunting Terrors, where I detail cases of victims' families taunted and terrorized by their loved ones' killers through anonymous phone calls or messages. This case is a little different from the rest in that in this case, the victim herself begins receiving harassing letters and phone calls from someone out to do her harm. She will eventually be kidnapped and attacked by the person who is given the name The Poet due to his rhyming letters. But when investigators finally discover who The Poet is, they and the public will be shocked and confounded. This is the case of Ruth Finley, and the poet. In 1978, Ruth Finley, born Ruth Smock in Richards, Missouri, was a 48-year-old married mother of two grown sons who worked for Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in Wichita, Kansas. On a warm summer day in August, Ruth was window shopping in the downtown area while she waited for her husband Ed to end his workday and pick her up for the drive home. Ed worked as an accountant in the city, and to save on gas, the two drove into work together each morning. As Ruth finished at the telephone company about an hour before Ed was done for his day, she often spent this hour downtown, either shopping or just taking a walk and looking into department store display windows, like she was doing on this day. All of a sudden, a man was by her side, matching her stride. She looked up at him as he began to speak, but she didn't recognize him. She thought he might be a bit mentally unbalanced as he began addressing her as if he knew her and talking about the good job she was doing at work. He then switched the conversation into mentioning how he believed photographs captured a person's true essence. She ignored him, but when he kept talking, she told him she was waiting for her husband. He then asked, Are you still married? When she didn't respond, he became angry, saying that he would, quote, remember her face, unquote, before he left. When Ed arrived, she told him about the strange encounter that had scared her, but he blew it off, saying it was probably just some guy who was trying to find a date. It didn't seem that way to Ruth, but she let it go. Ed might have taken this event a bit more seriously if Ruth had shared other strange incidents that had occurred that summer. The previous June, Ed had been working in their back patio when he collapsed. He was rushed to the hospital, and they feared he had suffered a heart attack. He seemed to improve once he arrived at the hospital. He then spent the rest of the day undergoing tests to find out what had caused the episode. Ruth drove herself home while Ed was kept overnight for observation. Ruth and Ed had been married since 1950, and he was only 49 years old. Their sons, Brent and Bruce, were grown and lived in other cities. That night would be the first time in almost three decades that Ruth would spend the night alone in her home. The night passed quietly, with Ruth watching television in the basement they had turned into a hobby room slash den. As she began walking upstairs to the kitchen, the phone rang. Ruth answered it quickly, worried that it might be the hospital calling. Instead, she heard a strange man's voice say, Is this Ruth Smock from Fort Scott, Kansas? Ruth was surprised to hear someone use her maiden name, and while she wasn't from Fort Scott, she had lived there for a time when she'd first left home and lived on her own. She answered in the affirmative. The man started asking her personal questions about her past, and particularly about the time she lived in Fort Scott. She became slightly alarmed at this line of questioning, as he still hadn't identified himself. She gave vague answers until he began to become angry. Finally, he blurted out, I know all about that night. He told her he had an article from the local newspaper from 1946, and began reading it to her. He then made a threat. He told her that if the information from this article should reemerge, it would be embarrassing to her. He asked her for money to keep quiet about the story. She hung up. Ed came home a few days later. It wasn't a heart attack he'd experienced, but he had re-injured his shoulder while working in the yard. The intense pain in his arm caused him to faint and mimic the pain of a heart attack. The couple was relieved, and Ruth decided not to say anything to her husband about the phone call believing it must have been some kind of a cruel prank. But a few weeks later, 
she received a letter in the mail at her workplace. Opening the envelope that had no return address and was written in a childlike scrawl, she saw an old newspaper clipping inside. The article detailed a story of a strange attack that had occurred over 30 years earlier and something Ruth thought was long ago buried in her past. We'd like to thank our new sponsor, Truman's. I know you all, like me, have a million things to do every day. Chores, driving kids around, working for the man. You don't need more time stolen from your day, am I right? So when you duck into the grocery store to pick up a few items, does it drive anyone else crazy that you have to peruse through 3,000 cleaning products just to make one or two selections? Just me? Didn't think so. That's why I'm excited to tell you guys about Truman's. Truman's is the coolest, most uncomplicated cleaning product company out there. Check this out. Truman's has created four non-toxic cleaners that cover every cleaning project in your entire home, from floors to bathrooms to kitchens. It will clean every surface safely and completely. Hey, if you have little kids or pets, you're probably cautious about what you use. Don't want those little hands or paws touching something toxic. Well, Truman's cleaning products are non-toxic, so there's no reason to worry. I got my Truman's starter kit, and it's so slick. You get all four cleaners to try in concentrated form. Did you know that most of what you're paying for and lugging home from the store with your cleaning products is water? Well, I don't know about you, but I already have water. Truman sends you the concentrated product in cartridges along with a handy spray bottle. Just fill the spray bottle with water, drop in the cleaning cartridge, and it makes one whole bottle of cleaner. See? Slick. With my starter kit, I got all four cleaners, an all-purpose kitchen cleaner, glass and technology cleaner, all-purpose bathroom cleaner, and a floor cleaner that works on all hard flooring surfaces. The bottles are refillable, saving you space and money. As a listener of this podcast, you can get 50% off. Yes, I said 50% off your Truman starter kit by visiting trumans.com and entering promo code ONCE at checkout. That's trumans.com and use promo code ONCE for 50% off your starter kit. Truman's is truly a better cleaning experience. We all love our pets, so it's always distressing when they're not feeling their best. When my pups are sad, I'm sad. Well, did you know that good nutrition is a key to your dog or cat's health? It's true. Over 80% of the immune system is influenced by gut health, and a proper diet and digestive health enables your pet to better fight environmental allergies, too. For these reasons, Solid Gold is passionate about gut health and formulates their products to positively impact the overall wellness of your pets. Solid Gold was the first holistic pet company in the U.S. They started in 1974 and was founded by a woman, Sissy McGill, who created natural pet food before it was cool. Sissy's founding belief is that high-quality pet food is the best way to impact our pet's mind, body, and spirit. I love that. Solid Gold foods are formulated to cleanse the digestive system with whole superfoods, balance with living probiotics, and fuel with omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. That's all the good stuff you need to support gut health and nourish your pet inside and out. And they have a recipe for any dog or cat's dietary needs, from toys and small breeds to large breeds, sensitive stomachs, and weight control. They have it all. And there are also supplements. I've added some solid gold bone broth with turmeric to my dog's food each day. It's made with human-grade beef bone broth and adds vitamins and minerals essential for their overall health. And they think it's yummy, too. There's so much more to say, but I don't have time to share it all with you here. So please check out their website, solidgoldpet.com once. And while you're there, you can get 30% off your first order for being a listener of this podcast. That's solidgoldpet.com slash once for 30% off your first order. And thanks for supporting the show. Ruth Smock was born on February 1st, 1930, to a farmer, Carl Smock, and his wife, Effie, who went by the name Faye. Ruth was the middle child of three. Her older brother was named Carl, and her little sister was Jean. When Ruth was 15, she left her tiny town of Richards, Missouri, home to just 100 residents, to live and attend high school in Fort Scott, Kansas. Fort Scott was just west and over the border from her hometown, about 30 minutes away. There she could attend a larger high school, where she took typing and sewing classes that were not available in Richards. At the age of 16, she began working part-time for the phone company while still in high school. She rented a room in a boarding house close to her school and her job. In October of 1946, 
16-year-old Ruth was in her boarding house when a man entered her apartment, grabbed her from behind, and held chloroform to her nose until she passed out. She didn't get a good look at the man and could only say that he was a white male. When she awoke, she found that she had been burned on both thighs, which were red and bleeding. She vaguely remembered seeing the man heating an iron on the stovetop. It was the iron that had left the burned brand on her legs. She also had superficial cuts on her legs, neck, and face. Ruth was taken to the hospital, and an examination revealed that her wounds were not very serious. There was no sign of a sexual assault, and her clothes had not been torn. However, she was shaken up, but soon put the event behind her, embarrassed that it had been reported on in the local papers as a, quote, sadistic attack by a sex maniac, unquote. Now, 30 years later, she'd received an anonymous call and letter from someone who learned about the attack and threatened to make it public once again. He knew where she lived and worked, calling her home and sending the newspaper clipping to her office. She immediately had ripped up the envelope with the clipping and threw it in the trash at work. She wanted to forget the whole thing, so she didn't mention it to anyone. But the man kept calling her both at her home and office numbers. She hung up as soon as she heard her name each time, not wanting to hear what he had to say. Ed had answered the phone at home, but each time he did so, the caller hung up without saying anything. She still hadn't told her husband about the harassing phone calls. But shaken up now after being approached on the street by the strange man, she decided to tell Ed, but she didn't mention the calls or letters. She wasn't even sure they were connected, and the calls seemed to have stopped. She decided once again to let the matter drop after Ed didn't seem to think it was anything to worry about. The anonymous calls and hang-ups which began in the summer of 1977 ended by October. After that, life went on as normal for Ruth and Ed Finley. Then in July of 1978, a year after she'd first been approached by the man in the street downtown, she saw him again. While on her lunch hour, she was standing in front of a store in downtown Wichita when she felt a firm hand grab her wrist and looked up to see the man. He was angry and yelled at her, Ruth, you stupid bitch! Terrified, she yanked away, pulling loose from his grasp. She ran into the department store and up the escalator. She quickly found a payphone and called her husband to pick her up. Ed could see his wife was shaken and asked her what had happened. The whole story about the phone calls and letters now came spilling out of Ruth. Ed insisted they report it to the police. Ruth just wanted to go home, so Ed took her there, but decided to make a report on his own. He traveled to the police station, and an officer took the report, but that was all. No one came to interview Ruth, and Ed never heard from the officer again. The following November, Ruth received another letter. This one rambled on for two pages and was threatening in nature. The writer demanded money or said he would harm her. She showed the letter to Ed, who said they needed to take it to the police. This time, the report was taken seriously. In fact, Ruth and Ed were taken into the office to talk to a detective with the Major Crimes Division. At first, Ruth didn't understand why this was necessary, but the detective, Lieutenant Bernie Drowatsky, along with every other officer in Wichita at the time, were looking for any leads to try and catch a killer known as BTK. Just over four years before Ruth and Ed Finley walked into the Wichita Police Department bearing a threatening letter, a family of four, Joseph and Julie Otero and two of their children, had been strangled to death in their Wichita home. Their 11-year-old daughter, Josephine, had also been tortured. Later, an anonymous tip led investigators to a hidden note found in the Wichita Public Library. The letter writer took responsibility for the Otero murders and signed it, Bind Them, Torture Them, Kill Them. BTK. A second BTK murder of a young mother, Shirley Vianne, took place in March of 1977. In December of that year, 25-year-old Nancy Fox was strangled by BTK, after which he sent a letter to television station KAKE, taking responsibility for the murders of both Nancy Fox and Shirley Vianne, and also a third woman who was unnamed but was determined later to be 21-year-old college student Catherine Bright. The third note from the BTK killer was sent to a local paper 
and included a poem. It was due to the ongoing BTK investigation that Ruth and Ed Finley were interviewed by Lieutenant Drowatsky and another detective, Richard Zortman, about the anonymous notes and letters Ruth had received. However, after speaking with the couple, the detectives didn't believe Ruth's letter writer was the same man who wrote the BTK letters. They told Ruth to contact them if any more letters arrived. A week later, one did. This one demanded Ruth place money under the seat of her husband's truck. The letter was full of misspellings and contained almost no punctuation, making it hard to read. He calls Ruth a bitch and a dumb, D-U-M, bitch several times. He then threatens to reveal how she was branded. The letter ends with a poem. Wherever you go on water or land, you still got to pay or I tell about your brand. I am smart and I know things to do. You talk to people I despise, like police lieutenant and telespies. It's clear that the writer knows Ruth has talked to the police, and even identifies one as lieutenant. The phone calls and letters continued over the next several days. Then later that month, Ruth Finley went missing. On November 21, 1978, Ruth Finley left for her scheduled lunch break at the telephone company. When she did not return, her boss began calling her sister Jean, who also worked in the phone company but in a different department. He also called her husband, Ed. Ed decided to call the police and report his wife missing. It was at this time that Ed told Ruth's sister about the phone calls and letters Ruth had been receiving. Up to this point, Ruth and Ed had kept the matter just between the two of them and the police. As the sun began to go down, the phone rang at the Finley home. Ed answered it, and a man said, Is this Ed Finley? I have your wife here. Thinking he was speaking to a kidnapper, he demanded to speak to Ruth. She got on the phone and told Ed she was okay and was in a liquor store a few miles away. The store clerk had allowed her to use the phone, and she'd already called the police. Ed, Jean, and Jean's husband, Bill, rushed to the liquor store, but by the time they arrived, Ruth had already been taken to the police station. They met her there, and she told them the following account. Ruth had been downtown on her lunch hour when an older model Chevrolet had pulled up to the curb in front of her. Before she knew what was happening, a man demanded that she get into the car. She was thrown into the back seat, followed by the man who she recognized as the same person who had accosted her before. Another man who she'd never seen was driving. She said both men were drinking out of a bottle that they passed back and forth to each other. They were speaking rapidly, with the man sitting next to her in the back seat, leaning into the front seat, so she couldn't hear everything they were saying. She did, however, hear the name of the driver, Buddy. The car was filled with junk, which, to Ruth, looked like typical items you might find on a farm, tools and rags and other debris. The door handle on her side had been broken off. At one point, they demanded her purse. She threw it, and the driver picked up a rock or a piece of concrete and hit her on the side of the face. She slumped into the back seat. Finally, after more time had passed, she told the kidnappers that she was in desperate need of using the bathroom. After a few minutes, where she continued to say it was an emergency, they pulled the car into a small park located by a river. It was already growing dark and was cold, so to prevent Ruth from trying to run off, they ordered her to remove her shoes and sweater. But as soon as she was let out of the car, Ruth took off running. She kept running for several minutes, hiding behind bushes and brush. She finally reached a hill and dared to look back towards where the car had been parked to see if they were following close behind. No one was there, and the car was also gone. She ran barefoot across a road and came to the liquor store where she'd run for help. Ruth still had her purse in her hands, but the kidnappers had taken her paycheck and some savings bonds with them. Also missing was some letterhead stationery from the phone company. The next day, Detective Zortman went to the park where Ruth said she'd run from the kidnappers. By the river's edge, he found her shoes and sweater, and some of Ruth's footprints, but nothing else. She was able to give a description of the car, but not the kidnappers. There was very little for them to go on. Officers were now given the assignment to keep an eye on Ruth when she came and went from work, especially when she was downtown waiting for Ed. However, they could not watch her all the time and warned her to be cautious when in public. Throughout the fall and winter, more letters were mailed to Ruth and others. 
the police received several letters taunting them and threatening Ruth. In February, a florist received an envelope containing $5 and a note asking him to send the black flower to Ruth Finley. In March, television station KARD got a phone call from a man who said he was Buddy, the driver during Ruth's kidnap attempt in November. He said he could give the name of the other man who was responsible for the calls and letters, as well as the kidnapping. A few minutes later, he called another television station with the same message. He said he would call the next day, and the police set up a trace on the phones for when he called back. He never did. The next month, April 1979, BTK struck again. He broke into the home of 63-year-old Anna Williams, but fortunately for her, she had spent the night at her daughter's that evening. He later sent a package to television station KAKE with some of the items he had taken from Williams's home, along with a poem that began, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? Police threw their energy and resources back into the BTK investigation in full force. People in Wichita were once again on high alert now that BTK was back in the news. Ruth's friends and co-workers spoke about the serial killer in their midst frequently, but even though they thought she should be the most worried, since her stalker and attempted kidnapper had still not been identified, Ruth seemed unconcerned. But maybe Ruth was just putting on a brave face. It was unlike her to become emotional in front of people. She was always very stoic, and even through all the turmoil she'd experienced, had kept a smile on her face. Ruth had been raised by hardworking farm folk, and both her mother and father had taught her that crying and carrying on was unseemly and unnecessary. In her mother's words, crying never did anyone any good. She was also taught not to burden others with her problems. In the Smock family, you didn't ask for help. You just pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps and got on with life. Ed was also a very stoic person, but reached out to the police when he felt a growing need for Ruth to be protected. But as the detectives saw that Ed was a very even keel and pragmatic person, they decided to deputize him. They showed him how to clear his home before he and Ruth entered it and how to shoot from a police stance. They taught him what shots to take to make sure to incapacitate a threat. Truth be told, this part was exciting for Ed, who lived a satisfactory if humdrum life as an accountant in a Midwest town. He stayed up late many nights hiding silently in his backyard, with his weapon ready for any trouble. But when trouble did come calling, it wasn't at the Finley's home, and Ed wasn't around to save his wife. The letters continued to be received by the Finleys even after the calls ceased once they changed to an unlisted number. But in July, the letters also stopped coming, and Ruth dared to hope that her stalker had finally given up. After a few weeks of silence, she even felt safe enough to travel to the mall alone one evening. She drove to the mall, made her purchases, and walked out to her car. It was late in the day, and there weren't many people still around. The sun was just beginning to set. As she approached her car and opened the door, she felt a hand grab her wrist. It was the kidnapper. Get in, he growled at her. Ruth's instincts told her to fight. There was no way she was letting this man take her away again. She pushed him away and turned to jump into the driver's seat. He grabbed at her, and now she saw a knife in his hand. He stabbed her three times quickly in the back as she scrambled behind the wheel. She turned the car on and began to drive away, managing to shut the door as the man began to run alongside the car. He grabbed at the partially open window. He was wearing gloves. She rolled the window up quickly, running on adrenaline now. The man pulled his hand away as the window closed over his fingers. She drove off, his gloves still attached between the window and the car's roof. She first felt the dampness before the pain. She looked down to see blood seeping down her side and back. Then she felt a searing pain. Seeing a payphone in the parking lot, she swerved the car over and called Lieutenant Drowatsky's number. It was picked up by another officer, and she informed him that she had been stabbed and told him her location. He said to sit tight. Help was on the way. Ruth, too scared to stay in one spot, told the officer she was close to home and would drive there instead. She hung up. The detective called Ed and told him about Ruth's call and said to be on the lookout for her and to transport her to the hospital as soon as possible. Ed waited anxiously in front of his house, looking up and down the street, until he saw Ruth swerving down the road at a fast speed. 
As she stopped, he ran up to the driver's side door and saw a knife protruding from her lower back, close to the side. He slid her over and drove to the emergency room. Drowatsky met them in the emergency room and was alarmed to see a large knife still sticking out of Ruth's side. She had three stab wounds. She was taken into surgery where the wounds were sutured. The surgeon told her she was lucky. A fraction of an inch more, and one of the cuts would have pierced her kidney. Ruth was made to remain in the hospital for a week. While there, she became depressed, believing that the stalker would not stop until he killed her. Police officers were posted outside her room, but she still didn't feel safe. Ruth had told the detective that the kidnapper had thrown a bag into her car as he attempted to push her inside. The bag was found in the back seat and contained rope, tape, a bottle of liquor, and a newspaper clipping about the investigation that mentioned Drowatsky. The glove was still in the window as well. No fingerprints were found on the items or the car. Ed, feeling increasingly powerless to protect his wife, came up with a plan. He decided to place a message in the classifieds of the local paper calling out the kidnapper and asking him what he wanted. He addressed the ad to the poet. The ad failed in its attempt to flesh out a suspect, but the name the poet was picked up by the media. And the paper soon began reporting on the strange case of Ruth Stalker and the attempted kidnapping and stabbing. The poet was getting more ink in the press than BTK at the time. Ruth was followed by police when she went into town and they even wired her with a recording device in case the poet showed up again, but he disappeared once more. Then a full four months later, on Christmas Eve, while Ruth and her family were eating dinner, their phone line was cut. Around the same time, a letter was found sticking between two boards in the Finley's front porch. Obviously, the poet wasn't yet giving up. The police had Ruth meet with Dr. Schrag a psychologist who placed her under hypnosis to try and draw out more details about her attacker. While under, she was able to give a more detailed description of the poet and also recalled a detail about a bridge over a river, although she couldn't explain what it meant. A new decade was ushered in, and the police still had not identified the poet. In early 1980, Drowatsky was removed from the case due to a promotion to another department, and Captain Mike Hill took over the investigation. He decided to re-examine the case from the beginning, first wondering if there was any way Ruth could be pulling a hoax on the police. But when he spoke to the hospital surgeon, he was told it was impossible for Ruth to have stabbed herself the way the wounds were located. Still, Captain Hill decided he would not share any more details of the investigation with the Finleys. Drowatsky had grown close to the couple, Hill thought too close, and had been free and open about their investigation. Hill put a lid on that. Ed, used to having free access to the investigation, was not happy about this change. He complained to Wichita's chief of police, Richard Lemunyan. Lemunyan told him he had no say over who Hill spoke to about his investigation, and Ed went home frustrated. About this time, the number of letters from the poet increased. Captain Hill also started receiving them. Other activity by the poet increased as well. The Finley's phone line was cut once more. They had an alarm installed on the back gate. Hill also had a camera placed in the Finley's backyard, which was monitored by three officers around the clock. In 1980, the technology was such that they had to keep an eye on the monitor while sitting in the Finley's dining room for their entire eight-hour shift. Ruth tried to make the officers as comfortable as possible, cooking for them and baking them treats. They became friendly with both Ed and Ruth in such close quarters. But now the poet just shifted his activity from Ruth's home to her workplace. On January 25th, she received a call at her desk. When she picked up, she heard, I have a surprise for you in the lobby, Ruth. She called Detective Zortman, who arrived and collected a package that was left in a phone booth in the building. Inside was a 12-inch butcher knife wrapped in a red bandana. The letters continued to be sent to Ruth and many other people. Between the end of 1979 and May of 1980, over 50 letters were delivered to various places, including Ruth's bank, where the writer requested money to be transferred out of her account. The motor vehicle department was told that Ruth's license should be revoked. A locksmith received a letter saying that the Finleys needed a new lock on their front door. A construction company was asked to leave a load of dirt in the Finleys' driveway. 
The health department received a letter warning that Ruth had a venereal disease, and utility companies received letters requesting that the Finley's water and power be turned off. The poet's letters were used to try and obtain more information about his identity. A consultant created a psychological profile of the letter writer and said he was severely psychotic, schizophrenic, pathologically paranoid, and a loner with a deep belief he was being persecuted. While interesting, it didn't help identify him. Copies were also sent to the FBI, who did a handwriting analysis to rule out Ed Finley as the writer. He was cleared. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation used a test to try and extract a blood type from the saliva on the envelopes, but this also proved fruitless. The poet's activities continued until the end of the year. A bottle with urine was found on Ruth's front porch. An unlit Molotov cocktail was found on the front lawn, and a lock was broken. On December 21st, Ruth and Ed were sitting downstairs in their basement when they heard glass breaking upstairs. Ed ran upstairs and found that their Christmas wreath was on fire and had burned so hot that their front window had cracked from the heat. Many of the letters, besides being threatening to Ruth, were also hateful. They often accused her of being sexually promiscuous, diseased, and a bitch. In February of 1981, a rock was found in a red bandana. Pieces of red bandana had also been sent inside letters and one was used to wrap up the butcher knife left at Ruth's office. It was a common item and could not be traced back to any specific person or place. There were a few leads over the years that ended up going nowhere. A letter was sent from another state, Oklahoma, and a man was identified as the sender. But when put into a lineup, Ruth said he did not resemble her kidnapper. It was also determined that he was not in the area at the time of the kidnapping or the other harassing events. A phone call was traced to a payphone 150 miles away from Wichita, and the caller was caught, but it turned out he was a mentally unstable man who lived in a nearby mental facility. It seemed like the poet would never be caught. That is, until he made one big misstep, which would lead to his undoing. The poet had sent letters to the Wichita Police Department more than once, sometimes threatening the detectives as well as Ruth. But in September of 1981, he took it to the next level. Chief of Police Richard Lemunyan had stayed out of the poet investigation, leaving it in the hands of his detectives. But on September 4th, he was informed that another letter had come in from the poet, and this time he had written that after he had taken care of Ruth, the chief's wife Sharon was next on his list. Lemunyan now decided enough was enough. He took the entire case file home with him that weekend and went through the details of the harassing phone calls, letters, vandalism, and the two kidnapping attempts on Ruth Finley. He spent the weekend painstakingly going through all 14 binders, and by Sunday, he believed he'd cracked the case. On Tuesday, September 8th, Monday had been the Labor Day holiday, he called a meeting, gathering 16 officers into the courthouse basement. Present were the detectives who had been in charge of the case over the past four years, Drowatsky, Zortman, and Hill. Lemunyan announced, The poet is Ruth Finley, and laid out his reasons for this conclusion. The Finley's home was located on East Indianapolis, a quiet dead-end street. Yet no one, not neighbors, officers, or the Finleys, had ever observed a person coming to the house to deposit letters, items, or vandalize the home. There were no footprints found in the yard where the poet had been many times, to cut the phone lines, leave items, etc. There were never any witnesses who saw the poet where Ruth had reported him, at the mall, the streets downtown, her workplace, or in her neighborhood. Once the camera was placed in the backyard of the Finley home, reports of the poet's activities there stopped. Same for the phone trace. Once it was placed on the Finley's phone, the man stopped calling and began sending letters. Only the police and the Finleys knew about the phone trace and the camera being placed in the backyard. No letters were delivered to the Finley home during the periods when they were out of town. When they returned, the letters started arriving again. As soon as Detective Hill took over the case, he received a letter from the poet. However, no announcement had been made that he had replaced Drowatsky. Again, the Finleys were the only outsiders who had this information at that time. When Ruth was kidnapped and escaped at the park, 
she said that at least one of the kidnappers had run after her. But when they investigated the scene, only one set of footprints, Ruth's, had been found there. Lemunyan didn't believe Ed was involved and wasn't even sure he was aware of his wife's deception. As far as what the doctors had said about Ruth's knife wound not being self-inflicted, he said he didn't agree. He thought doctors often underestimated what a person could or would do. As a law enforcement officer, he knew that people were capable of anything. The stab wounds had been near her kidney, easy enough to reach around with a knife of that length, he said. Lemunyan believed another look at the medical report would prove him correct. I have to say this. I can only imagine when the chief made this announcement, cracking the case after only a weekend of reading the case file, you must have been able to hear a pin drop in that room. There was more than two dozen officers, including experienced detectives working on this case for four years, with no idea or even a thought that Ruth herself could have been responsible. Some of the officers thought Lemunyan was off his rocker, but once he laid out his case point by point, they had to agree it was a possibility. Lemunyan's next announcement was that he was ordering a 24-hour-a-day surveillance on the Finleys for the next two weeks. He demanded the utmost confidentiality from his officers, telling them not to discuss the investigation with anyone, not even their spouses. Lemunyan was absolutely certain that Ruth was the poet, and meant to prove it quickly and close this case. He had one advantage over all the other officers who'd been involved in the investigation. He had never met Ruth Finley. He realized that the detectives and officers who'd gotten to know Ruth and liked her could not see past the woman they knew to be a nice, middle-aged lady to consider her a suspect. But on paper, without his judgment clouded by familiarity with Ruth, he was able to quickly conclude who the evidence pointed to, Ruth herself. The surveillance operation began right away, with the command center van parked at the end of the Finley's block. From there, they could watch the couple come and go and sent officers to tail them whenever they left their house. One police vehicle and one helicopter was assigned for this duty. A little over a week later, on September 17th, the Finleys made a trip to the nearby mall, followed by officers. As Ed pulled into the parking lot, Ruth exited the car and dropped some envelopes into a mailbox. The postal inspector was called to meet officers at the mailbox to retrieve the mail. It took a few hours, but once he arrived, he and the officers took the mailbag to the post office to go through it. Ruth's letters were still on top. There were five envelopes. Two were bill payments, and one was a letter with Ruth's return address in the corner. The other two envelopes had no return address and were written in the poet's childlike scrawl. One was addressed to a reporter at KAKE-TV, and the other to Ruth. They now had proof that Ruth was the poet. That weekend, officers arrived at Ruth's office to look for more evidence. They searched her wastebasket near her desk and found a book of poetry, a piece of red bandana hidden inside a paper towel, a sheet of carbon paper that contained the poet's handwriting, and a tablet that matched paper the poet's letters were written on. Lemunyan decided to continue the surveillance just a little longer. He wanted to make sure he had more than enough evidence to prove Ruth was the poet. The next weekend, the Finleys again left their home and drove to the bank and the mall. Once again, Ed stopped at the mailbox and Ruth got out and mailed some letters. The police were ready, and as soon as they drove away, they swung into action and blocked off the mailbox. Within 30 minutes, the postal inspector arrived to collect the mail from the box, alerted by the cops. This time, there were four letters. Three were regular correspondence, but the fourth was written in the poet's handwriting and addressed to Ruth. They allowed the mail to continue on to its destination, and on October 1st, Detective Hill called Ed Finley. He asked him if he'd gotten his mail that day, but Ed said he was still at work and had not been home. Go home and get your letter, Hill directed. We know you have one. We received a carbon copy here at the station. When Ed arrived at Hill's office, he was taken into an interview room. We know who the poet is, Ed, Hill told him. Ed looked excited to finally be getting some answers. Then Hill showed him some pictures. They were of Ruth mailing letters at the mailbox. Ed was confused. Hill explained that they were photographs taken while they had been under surveillance 
In these photos, Ruth was mailing the letters from the poet, they told him. In fact, she had mailed five poet letters in the last two weeks. Ed was stunned. Hill laid out the other evidence they found at her office. Hill told Ed that he wasn't a suspect, but they needed to eliminate him and asked him to take a polygraph. He immediately agreed. They also said they wanted to search his home, and he gave his permission for the detectives to do so. They already had a warrant, but they wanted to inform him that the police were on their way there now. Ed went to the house with the officers and waited in the living room while the search was conducted. They found another book of poetry, carbon paper, pieces of red bandana, writing tablets they suspected were used for some of the poet's letters, and stamps that came from the same numbered sequence as the recently mailed poet letters. Ruth was now at the police station. Detective Drowatsky had met her in the lobby of the telephone company as she left for work that day at 5 p.m. He asked her to come to the station to look at some mugshots, but once they arrived, instead of taking her to his desk, he escorted her into an interview room. Mike Hill joined along with another officer, Lieutenant Jack Leon. Hill told her they'd already spoken to Ed and then read her her rights. The detective asked her to take him back through her encounters with the poet, which she did calmly. He then began to ask her who was present with her on several occasions. The day she found a rock wrapped in a bandana on her porch? She was alone when she found that. Who found the ice pick on the front porch in 1980? She did, she answered. The eggs by the sliding door? Also her. The bottle of urine? She had found that. The questioning continued in this vein, and Ruth, who'd begun the interview with a calm and friendly demeanor, began to stiffen, and her expression grew pinched. Hill then asked, Ruth, have you ever written any of those letters? No, sir, she answered. He then asked, have you ever mailed any of those letters? No, sir, she answered again. Hill then said, what if I call you a liar? I have pictures, evidence that shows that you have. Do you want to keep playing this game? When did I mail a letter? Ruth finally asked. He showed her the photos and told her about the surveillance, how she'd been followed and officers had witnessed her putting the letters in the mailbox. Do you want me to show you the letter? Hill asked. No, Ruth said quietly. Hill now wanted to know why Ruth had pretended to be the poet. He wanted to know why she claimed to be stalked, threatened, and even kidnapped. She didn't answer. He told her about the other evidence they had collected from her office wastebasket and her home. She still had nothing to say. Hill again asked why. Ruth just kept shaking her head. He finally asked, Do you need some help, Ruth? Her almost imperceptible answer was, Yes. Hill brought up the story about being branded at Fort Scott when she was 16. Ruth sat up straighter and firmly said, No, I did not make that up. Hill wanted to know if there was anything he'd mentioned that she hadn't done. She said she had not set fire to the wreath. He asked if Ed had any knowledge of what she had done, and she firmly said, Absolutely not. When they began questioning her about Ed was the first time that Ruth began to cry. They began to ask her for details of how she had done certain things, but she remained silent. Once when she was asked if there was any more pieces of the red bandana at her home, she answered, it's all gone. Asking for details about the kidnapping, they wanted to know how she had gotten from the mall to the park, where she said she'd escaped from the kidnappers. She admitted that she'd taken the bus. The description that she'd given of the kidnapper, where had that come from? He looks a little like the guy that stopped me on the street, Ruth answered but detectives suspected no strange man had ever confronted her. In fact, Hill now told her that they had suspected for some time that she'd described the last person she'd seen before undergoing hypnosis, Dr. Schrag. The composite picture resembled the psychologist quite a bit. Ruth's interrogation yielded a mixture of half admissions and some insistence that she did not remember doing the things the detectives were accusing her of. The detectives themselves were split on what they believed. Drawatsky and Zortman, the original investigators assigned to the case, believed Ruth was mentally ill and had not deliberately or consciously created the poet. Chief Lemunyan and Detective Hill also believed that she had mental problems, but felt she knew what she was doing and her actions were geared towards attention-seeking. She was older, her children were grown, she'd been in the same job for decades, and her life with her accountant husband was less than exciting. Maybe having a stalker, 
and the around-the-clock attentions from officers and the media created the drama she craved, they thought. But Hill was willing to have Ruth interviewed by a doctor and brought Dr. Schrag in to speak with her. Ruth was now in tears and could barely hold her head up from the table. They wanted to make sure she wasn't having some kind of complete breakdown. When the doctor asked her what she was feeling, she told him she felt she wanted to die. He asked her if she felt like something was wrong in her mind in the last two or three years, and she agreed that she did feel like that, but didn't know why exactly. I guess I'm just crazy, she said. Dr. Schrag then explained that it was possible that part of her mind didn't remember what the other part was thinking or doing. He then asked her if she felt like she was a different person when she did some of these things. At this, Ruth stopped answering, but seemed to be contemplating his question. Instead of arresting Ruth, the detectives decided she needed to be admitted to the hospital for observation. She had talked of wanting to die, and they were afraid she was suicidal. They also still needed answers as to why she had perpetrated such a long and elaborate hoax. Perhaps doctors could make some sense of her actions. That evening, after about three hours of questioning, Hill turned off the tape recorder, and a squad car drove her to St. Joseph's Medical Center to be admitted into the psychiatric ward. As far as charges being filed against Ruth Finley, the district attorney for Sedgwick County decided to wait 90 days until psychological testing was completed before deciding on whether he would prosecute. But, he told reporters, the most serious charge she could face for her actions was a misdemeanor for falsely reporting a crime. The Wichita Police Department, after adding up all the charges for the extra hours officers had put into the Finley case, as well as the costs of surveillance cameras, aircraft, police artists, and more, added up to over $370,000, or over $1 million in today's dollars. While committed to the hospital, Ruth was assigned to meet with a psychiatrist, Dr. Andrew Pickens. At first, Dr. Pickens could not get a lot out of his new patient when he asked her about her feelings. He quickly realized that Ruth had repressed any strong emotions almost her entire life. When he asked about her family and her childhood, she would only say that she had a wonderful childhood and that her parents were always loving and caring. They didn't have a lot, she explained. She had grown up on a farm and her parents worked hard. She said her mother especially had it hard, but didn't elaborate. However, she'd always ended by saying that she'd had wonderful parents and a happy home life. But tests Dr. Pickens conducted of Ruth Finley's mental state showed that she was in a state of massive repression. He knew it would take some time for her to be able to fully express her true emotions, and he suspected that the alter ego of the poet had allowed her to express strong emotions like anger, guilt, sadness, and shame. As a psychoanalyst, helping his patients uncover and heal from past pain and trauma was what he specialized in. He believed he could help Ruth, too. Dr. Pickens' report to the judge said, in part, that Ruth had a long history of burying feelings she learned as a child were unacceptable and she was able to maintain this repression until her husband had a medical crisis four years earlier. She then broke psychologically and created the poet to act out on her feelings of anger, fear, and anxiety. The doctor also said he believed that most of the time she was aware of what she was doing, but not why she was doing it. This guilt then caused her to make herself the poet's target of abuse and harassment. He listed his diagnosis for Ruth as, quote, atypical impulse disorder, with dissociative and depressive features, unquote. He recommended that Ruth continue to receive intensive psychotherapy twice a week. After a month at the hospital, Ruth was cleared to return home. The district attorney decided against filing any criminal charges on the condition that Ruth remain in therapy. So what are we to make of all this? It seems absolutely unbelievable that someone could pull off such a hoax fooling everyone, including their own spouse and a precinct full of detectives and officers, without being found out. Also, do we believe that she was aware of her actions or not? I'll give you a little more to think about along those lines. Soon after Dr. Pickens wrote his report saying that she was, quote, fully aware of her actions most of the time, unquote, he changed his opinion. He came to believe that Ruth Finley was completely unaware 
that she was in fact the poet. I'll give you some details of what Ruth shared with the doctor about her childhood, which informed this opinion. On describing her life growing up on the farm with her parents, Carl and Faye, and her siblings, Ruth began by saying she had a perfect childhood. She repeated more than a few times that, quote, we were poor, but we had everything we needed, unquote. Her mother, Faye, was very religious, Ruth said, and always carried her Bible with her. During these sessions, Dr. Pickens also learned that Faye Smock wasn't affectionate with her children and didn't like when they showed strong emotions. She forbade them to cry and instructed them to bury their emotions. Crying never did anyone any good, she often told her children. Ruth was the most emotional of the children and, it seemed, was an anxious child from her youngest days. She was much more dependent on her mother than the other children and cried when she was out of her sight. This became a source of anger and frustration for Faye, who hated that Ruth was such a crybaby. Ruth learned to feel guilty and like a burden to her mother when she showed her emotions, so she learned to keep them to herself. She was also shamed when she asked for help. Her mother had it hard, Ruth said. She really didn't specify what was so hard for her mother, though. Was it helping with the farm? Raising her children? Ruth didn't say. She only said she didn't want to burden her mother by going to her with her problems and learned to remain silent. Happiness was not something that was prioritized in the Smock family. Ruth said that her parents raising their children during the Depression encouraged them to survive, not to succeed. They were also not supposed to be prideful or look for any special attention. If someone said anything complimentary to me, Ruth said, my mother would find a flaw in it because she didn't want us to become conceited. Ruth recalled that as a child, her aunts had repeated a story to her about her birth. They said it had been a very difficult birth for Faye, coming so soon after her brother was born. There was only 13 months between the two. Her aunts told her that her mother had almost bled to death, and the pain she'd gone through to have Ruth was excruciating. Ruth believed this was why her mother seemed to dislike her. She'd been a problem child beginning from her very birth, she thought. Ruth insisted that her attack with the hot iron in Fort Scott had actually happened. Her parents had been called, and she felt guilty that they'd had to travel to pick her up from the hospital. They took her back to Richard's with them, but after only a few days, they decided she was well enough to return to her apartment in Fort Scott. She went, not wanting to be a burden, but became physically ill every time she entered her apartment. Her mother helped her find a different place to live in Fort Scott. Ruth even put a positive spin on this, saying that it was at her second apartment building that she'd met Ed, who was also a tenant there. While Dr. Pickens believed that something had happened at Fort Scott, he wasn't sure if it was the actual attack that Ruth described or some other kind of trigger that caused her to harm herself and repress this memory. Ruth stayed in therapy with Dr. Pickens for a four-year period, and progress moved slowly. Ruth was very reluctant to show any feelings or emotions, but at the same time was growing more dependent on the doctor for her emotional outlet. He had to make sure that she wasn't just answering in the way she thought would please him, as it seemed like Ruth had spent her entire life trying to live up to the expectations of others. She described to the doctor one of her earliest memories as being gifted a book of children's poems from her aunt. She loved the book, as she seldom received gifts. However, many of the poems in the book, as is traditional, were cautionary tales for children. Little girls and boys are described as bad or good, dependent on their behavior and actions. Ruth began to read into these poems, thinking they were pointing out what a bad girl she was. She said she finally got rid of the book, hiding it in a pile of fence posts behind the house. She was afraid if anyone read it, they'd know what a terrible little girl she was, and they'd have to kill her. Dr. Pickens now thought he understood why Ruth had used poems in the anonymous letters to express her anger and shame. In fact, it was when Ruth started writing poems and bringing them to share with Dr. Pickens that he finally discovered the trauma that she had experienced as a child. The first poem Ruth read to the doctor told of her sadness as a child and also now described how she felt unloved by her mother the very first time she'd expressed her true feelings about how she'd been treated. The poem read, A little girl alone in tears, the worst person born in years. I don't have a mother, I am not born. No one upset, and she's not forlorn. Now that Ruth began to express her feelings, some of her painful child memories began to return to her consciousness. She remembered that there was another farmhouse nearby. 
her family began to visit with the farmer and his wife. The farmer was very kind to her and used to say she was pretty and how he liked her hair. She had never received compliments before, so she liked him right away. These memories began when she was about three years old. Sometime later, she recalled being a very young child and sitting on the farmer's wife's lap. But she remembered that she was naked and crying. She couldn't recall why or if this had actually happened. Then a month or so later, she began having dreams, except she knew they weren't dreams, but memories. She told Dr. Pickens a terrible story. She had been about three and a half years old and was driving somewhere with her father, and they stopped at the farmer's house. For some reason, he left Ruth there. She didn't know where her mother was or why her father hadn't taken her with him. The farmer was alone in the house and asked if she wanted to play a game while she waited for her father to return. She wasn't sure because she didn't like hide-and-seek. It scared her. He said that they would play a different game. Ruth then began to tell the rest of the story in the third person, saying, the little girl, instead of I. The man put a metal key in the little girl's coveralls and then made a game of searching for it. But before long, he was taking her clothes off and touching her. She began to cry, and the man got angry. He shoved a red bandana in her mouth before tying her on the bed with a rope or string, and then tried to rape her. She believed he couldn't do it because she was too small, so he forced oral sex on her. While this was happening, Ruth said the other little girl appeared. It was as if she had split into two people and was floating above herself. However, she could see the little girl below and felt guilty that she had left her and wasn't helping her. This Dr. Pickens understood to be Ruth's mind dissociating from her body. It's a survival mechanism that people experiencing severe trauma like war or rape may experience, a splitting off from oneself. Because the two families saw each other often, Ruth was sexually abused by this man several times. She didn't tell anyone because she had learned that you're not supposed to burden other people with your problems and because the man had threatened her if she did. The memory Ruth had of sitting on his wife's lap, she believed, was something that actually occurred when the woman had caught her husband in the act. She had cleaned Ruth up and sent her home, but didn't tell her parents. Ruth also learned that when she cried, the man became angrier and more brutal, so she learned to leave her body right away so she wouldn't react and make things worse. She learned to bury her pain deep inside in order to survive. Over time, as she talked about these painful memories in her sessions, Dr. Pickens asked her to start using I and me instead of addressing the little girl as someone else. In this way, he was helping Ruth to own these memories and know that she had survived and could now reintegrate into one whole person. The doctor felt this was important to ensure that the poet would never reappear in the future during times of stress. Ruth said she was never completely convinced that she was the poet until one day, when a vivid memory resurfaced. She could see herself sitting in her car near the mall. She was alone. She saw the knife in her hand and heard in her head, you have to do it. So she plunged the knife in three times as hard as she could. She remembers feeling no pain. As she drove down the road, she felt the pain finally and the memory of stabbing herself faded. In her mind, the man who'd approached her in the street had done it. Dr. Pickens would explain that when a person dissociates as completely as Ruth had, they no longer felt connected to their body, so Ruth could have stabbed herself without feeling any pain. Some still wonder what made Ruth begin the poet activities. Some believe it must have been the news stories of the women and one child being tortured and murdered by the man calling himself BTK. But Ruth says she really doesn't remember paying much attention to that story at the time. The trigger, Ruth continued to say, was the man who accosted her on the street and reminded her of her attack in Fort Scott. It's all very curious. Ed had been hospitalized at the same time, but Ruth says she doesn't believe this bothered her enough to cause the trauma. The doctor, though, believes it could have set off a reaction in Ruth. She remained adamant that it had been the stranger in the street who threatened her, and Ruth would always insist that this first confrontation with a stranger was real. But was it? Or was he only real in her mind? Ruth remained in therapy with Dr. Pickens for four years. 
She had learned to express her feelings much more openly, became more assertive in dealing with others, and her anxiety had been greatly reduced. She had brought Ed into a few therapy sessions when she had something particularly difficult to share with him. Ed remained supportive, but was glad when the time and expense of the therapy ended. About a year later, she returned when she was struggling with other memories. She continued to see Dr. Pickens for about a year before finally concluding her therapy in June of 1988. The media had remained interested in Ruth's story, and now that she was stronger and understood her motivations for inventing the poet, she decided it was time to tell the truth as she knew it. Dr. Pickens joined her for some of the interviews to explain dissociation and the progress that Ruth had made in therapy. Her story was featured in People magazine, on The Oprah Winfrey Show, and many newspapers and television talk shows. After her story became public, Ruth received more information that helped put the pieces of the puzzle of her life together. Her brother Carl told Dr. Pickens that he remembered an argument between his parents when he was a child. They were discussing their neighbor, and his mother seemed angry. He heard his father say he wouldn't do anything like that. But after that, Carl remembered they stopped visiting the other family. In 1991, Ruth Finley retired from the phone company. In her retirement, she spent time knitting hats and scarves to donate to U.S. troops in Afghanistan. She also was a volunteer who translated books into Braille. Both of her sons married and had children. Ruth enjoyed spending time with her three grandchildren. Ruth Carolyn Finley died at the age of 89 on May 30, 2019. Ed had passed away eight years earlier. She was remembered fondly by family, friends, and co-workers. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. What did you think of that story? I told you it was a doozy. What are your thoughts about Ruth Finley? Did she become the poet for the attention, or was she truly experiencing a dissociative disorder? I invite you to share your thoughts with me and other listeners by joining the Once Upon a Crime Facebook fan page. Next week, I'll be starting a new series for October. It's going to be a fun one, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Want a sneak peek? Then you have to join Patreon, where you'll get a heads up on upcoming series, a welcome gift pack of goodies, ad-free episodes, and more. I plan to do a off-the-cuff discussion of this case next week on Patreon for you. There's so much more to dive into this story about what I think about Ruth Finley, about her diagnosis, and also about some evidence that I found that confirmed my theory as I was researching this episode. I really want to talk with you guys about it, so make sure you join Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another.